Hi guys, we're going to continue our look today uh, at cotton. So we're going to round up our cotton fabrics. And just to start off, I want to remind you guys to check the assignments section on Blackboard because the uh, second collection project, um, uh, the information about it uh, has been posted. So please take a look. Um, it is, again, exactly like our first collection project. Um, so nothing new there. You guys should know um, exactly what is expected, especially uh, after we've gotten through with the first critique, but it has a due date and everything else for it. And again, I just am looking for the same project, so it's the same requirements, but I would like to see a little bit of improvement uh, for everybody on uh, their second project. Of course, that's tra the trajectory that we want. We want to keep improving um, as we go. And of course, since the second time around, and usually the second time we do anything, we improve a little bit, and each time we do it, we improve a little bit more. So that will be our goal. So just wanted to let you know about that uh, before we start today's lesson. All right, let's begin. All right, so uh, we left off about in the middle of our cotton fabric, so I want to pick up and cover the category of sheer cottons next. Uh, so sheer fabrics are fabrics that you can see through. When something is sheer, it means you can kind of see through it. It's um, not completely transparent, but um, easily seen through. Uh, and again, these fabrics can vary from being very sheer, or you can see through them very easily, or kind of semi-sheer, so you can only kind of see through it a little bit. Now, if a fabric is not sheer at all, we can also call it opaque, um, which means that, uh, again, we can't see through it at all. Nothing is seen on the other side of the fabric. And we have just an example of a sheer fabric in use. So, um, since we're on the category of sheer fabrics, I want to cover the topic of an open weave. So, um, many sheer fabrics, act actually most sheer fabrics, will utilize um, a technique called an open weave to achieve um, their ability to be sheer um, or to be uh, see-through. And basically, an open ref uh, weave refers to any fabric uh, that is woven with a little bit of space between each yarn. And that little bit of space, again, uh, allows us to be able to see through the fabric. And the more open it is, um, uh, tends to create a fabric that is more see-through. And if it's just a little bit, it's maybe a little bit less see-through. Um, and again, this is typically how we achieve our uh, see-through characteristics in fabric. And indeed, most of these fabrics that I cover um, subsequently will utilize an open weave technique to achieve um, their sheer characteristic. Our first sheer fabric is Batiste. Uh, Batiste is a light, um, semi-sheer, so not completely sheer, uh, cotton plain weave. It's typically soft and limp. It's often mercerized for an added luster. Um, and Batiste almost always uses what's called combed cotton yarns. So there, uh, this process of uh, uh, combed cotton yarns refers to a process of treating the cotton fibers before they are spun into yarns. And this creates a sort of softer feeling fabric. Uh, we'll see this technique very often used in bedding because of course we want a sort of soft, gentle, nice feeling fabric. So we'll see combed cotton yarns a lot of times in bedding, but also in fabric because a lot of times we want a nice soft feeling. Uh, and again, it, a lot of times it goes hand in hand in sort of a limp, a little bit more flowing fabric as well as sort of a nice soft feeling fabric. Gauze. Now, we might be most familiar uh, with gauze in its use for bandages, which it's often used for. Um, we can buy gauze in strips to use um, to dress wounds and things like that. Um, but indeed, we can use it for garments as well, and it often is. Um, uh, uh, Gaz uh, got, uh, originally got its name uh, for its city of origin, Gaza, and uh, it's typically soft, limp, uh, sheer, sheer to semi-sheer. So Gaz uses a specific type of weave called the Leno weave. Now the Leno weave is a variation of plain weave, often used in open weaves. Uh, now, what it does is um, it will help stabilize the open weave. So if you imagine there's all this space between um, the different yarns in an open weave, uh, but this specific technique helps stabilize the open weave 
so the yarns aren't just sort of sliding all around and it doesn't get unduly warp. Uh, but it also creates this kind of bubbly texture uh, we see in gauze. Um, sometimes we'll see lots of bubbly textures in, in, uh, uh, in maybe a crepe or um, other different types of fabrics. Um, but they're typically created using different means. In this specific fabric, uh, that sort of bubbly texture is, is actually created by the leno weave. And what the leno weave does is it takes these warp yarns and after every pass of a weft, it sort of twists uh, along its sort of partner. So here we have this warp yarn and it goes under a weft and then it kind of twists over its partner or its neighbor and goes, you know, under again and then twists over and then goes under again, twist, twist, twist. So this yarn, this warp yarn is actually only going under. Its partner is only going over. We still get this sort of under over pattern if we go straight down. So we, oops, I'm sorry guys. We're still getting an over under pattern if we go down this one line over under over under over under, but all these guys are going and they're twisting positions, um, and that's called again the leno weave and it's quite old and again it's it's used to help stabilize open weaves, loose open weaves I should say. Our next fabric is lawn, um, and we're gonna have a kind of there's. Uh, three categories, batiste, lawn, and voile, which we'll get to, and they're all very, very similar fabrics with very small differences. And if you uh, mix them up, you're kind of forgiven because they're very, very um, uh, similar. So lawn is also a semi-sheer fabric that, again, is very close to batiste. It's made with a plain weave. It's not quite as soft as batiste. It's a bit more crisp. It's not super crisp, um, but batiste is very, very soft, very, very flowing. Um, and lawn is, is, it doesn't need to be printed, but it's often is printed. So if you find a sort of semi-sheer, semi-crisp cotton with a print, it's typically lawn. Next we have organdy, which is cotton's answer to its relative organza. Um, organza is a silk fabric, but organdy is a cotton fabric. It's um, created using, of course, an open weave, but with very tightly twisted, stiff yarns. And it indeed is a very, very crisp, very, very sheer fabric. Um, it feels very close to almost like a, a fine mesh or almost like a tool, um, um, more than, you know, your typical cotton fabrics. Next we have voile, and again voile is in that sort of partnering that I was talking about before. Um, again, very close to lawn and batiste. Um, it's a light, semi-sheer, semi-crisp fabric. It's not quite as tightly woven as batiste or lawn, so it's um, a little bit more see-through than either of those two fabrics. Um, and voile means veil in French, um, which was the garment it was originally uh, used to make. That concludes our sheared fabrics for cotton, uh, our, uh, and we'll move on to our piled cottons. Uh, now, piled fabrics refer to any fabrics that are woven with an extra set of yarns that are allowed to sort of loop up and a, up and above uh, the sort of base layer of the fabric. Uh, it gives these fabrics a plush, almost furry texture. And here's sort of if you were looking at the fabric. You know, um, uh, if you were laid out, uh, laid out the fabric on a table and sort of got eye level with the table surface and looked at the fabric, you can see here's the fabric itself and then the extra set of yarns that are created um, sort of looping up upwards with this texture itself. Now sometimes uh, this looped pile is kept as loops, sometimes it's cut. Um, so we will refer to the pile as either being looped or being cut. And the loops, so here's an, a picture of a looped pile. The loops stay intact. You can see the full looped. Um, the cut piles, we will weave it with the loops, but then we'll kind of cut off the tops of them. So they're just sort of furry little uh, yarns coming up and there's, there's no looping around. They're just sort of cut uh, and coming straight up and ending without attaching to themselves. 
Our first pile of cotton is corduroy, very uh, popular uh, and commonly uh, recognizable uh, fabric. So corduroy roughly translates from French uh, to mean cord of the king. Um, and this is because corduroy got its name um, because it was a popular fabric worn by servants of the French kings in the 1600s. So corduroy is thick, it's heavyweight, and it has these distinctive lengthwise ribs called whales uh, that are made and cut from its pile. So its pile is cut, it's not looped, and it's cut and woven in such a way that we get these sort of very lengthwise, um, always along the length grain, uh, ribs. So um, uh, they can range in width. The whales can be quite wide, they can be quite narrow, they can um, range, but we're always going to get this ribbing texture created by um, uh, the pile, how it's cut, and how it's woven. Next is terry cloth. So terry cloth is another very popular, easily, easily recognizable fabric. Uh, it's most notably seen in towels and robes due to its excellent ability to absorb moisture. So that extra looped pile, and terry cloth always has a looped pile, and you can see it very closely here, the little loops um, coming up off the pile, that extra cotton, extra fabric. Um, and again, remember that cotton is very, very absorbent, so we add more of that, that nice plush texture, uh, that nice looped arrangement, in addition to the natural ability of cotton to absorb moisture, makes it very, very absorbent. And again, that's why we use it in towels and robes and things like that. However, we're not limited to that. Garments can be made out of terry cloth as well. A lot of times um, they're very comfortable because of their ability to wick sweat off of people. Um, typically when we do see terry cloth used in garments, we'll see a version of terry cloth called French terry uh, or French terry cloth. Now this cloth is um, the same sort of idea that has a looped pile. Um, however, French terry is typically different, where typical terry cloth, will, you'll usually see the loops on both sides um, of the fabric, so on the wrong and right side. French terry will typically have a smooth uh, right side and a looped wrong side, um, and it, it's also knit. So typical terry cloth is woven, and our French terry cloth is knit. Uh, and we see it very often in, in like uh, for use in sweatpants and sweatshirts and things like that. And again, we see that looped on the wrong side and sort of a typical knit, smooth knit texture on the uh, face side. Next we have velveteen, and velveteen is cotton's answer to uh, silk velvet. Um, typically we'll see either velvet in a synthetic relative or silk. Um, but of course we will uh, see uh, the same principles uh, and properties uh, across all fibers, but typically when it's called, uh, when it's made in cotton, we'll call it a velveteen. And um, velveteen has a, a soft, limp fabric uh, with a short cut pile. So it's not, the pile is not typically too plush or too long and it's cut, so it's not looped. Um, and so we typically have just a little bit of plushness, a little bit of fullness to the fabric. Next, we're going to go over cotton prints. Uh, and of course, although we can print almost any pattern or design onto almost any fabric, there are certain printed patterns and techniques that are traditionally associated with cotton fabrics. Um, and cotton has long been favored for prints as it takes dye well, especially after um, the mercerization process. We'll start off with batik, which is um, alphabetically correct and also chronologically correct, as it is one of our oldest forms of dyeing, uh, and traces its roots across Asia, India, and Africa. Um, it refers to a process of dyeing where wax is applied to usually a plain weave cotton. Uh, the fabric is dipped into a dye vat or sometimes brushed with va uh, dye to be a bit more specific, and the wax protects certain parts of the fabric from the dye. The process is repeated to create beautiful, elaborate patterns. Uh, the wax can sometimes crack a bit and allows for some dye to seep through. Uh, and so batik can usually be recognized by these distinctive cracks. And you can sort of see the cracking of the dye here. It gives this sort of interesting technique uh, or texture to it. Um, we see here a traditional method 
uh, of batik, so a uh, utensil here. Uh, we pour hot wax into here, and you can draw on different designs with great accuracy uh, onto the fabric. Um, batik fabrics are still popular today all across the world, and uh, batik itself has sort of elevated itself uh, to its own art form. Uh, where many artists sell their uh, uh, batik fabrics, not for use in garments, but simply as uh, standalone art pieces. Next we have calico. So calico is a printed style that is most seen on a crisp cotton plain weave. Uh, it typically has a tight uh, all over print pattern featuring a small designs. Uh, they're usually floral in nature, but nature, but can be other things as well, uh, so long as they're tight um, uh, and has this sort of all over repeating pattern. So calico prints can also be called Liberty prints after a fabric company that specialized in printing them. It was an English company. Um, uh, and again, they typically used all these uh, um, calico prints. Calico itself actually um, uh, gets its name from a, a sort of um, uh, um, root in uh, Calcutta because these prints are actually tradition traditionally Indian in nature. Next we have paisley. So paisley refers to a, st a style of print that features a complex design, uh, typically using a teardrop pattern shape. So that's the sort of paisley shape that gives makes it a paisley print. Sometimes they're sort of curled off or whatever else, um, but they're typically uh, uh, just a teardrop and ornately patterned as well. Um, they can be multicolored or sort of uh, just two colors, um, and it can be found printed on many cotton shirtings, but can be found on other fabrics and fibers as well. Polka dot. Again, another popular print that can be seen on many different fabric types with many different color combinations and dot sizes. Uh, but it just refers to any printed pattern with a repeating dot pattern. Tie-dye. Uh, this dyeing technique is usually applied to cotton knits, but can be used for other weaves and fibers as well. We typically see it um, in the famous tie-dye t-shirt. Originally, it was done by individuals decorating their own garments, but its popularity has caused designers to use this technique and pattern in all sorts of clothing. It's achieved by twisting and tying off parts of a fabric or garment and then dipping it into a vat of colored dye. Different vats are used for different colors. Uh, once dried, the um, fabric or garment is un untied, untwisted, and results in a, a sort of pattern that looks like this. Very much associated with the hippie movement of the 60s. Other cottons, weaves, and yarns and finishes. So this is sort of a grab bag of other cotton fabrics that don't really fit into any of these other categories. First we have chenille. Uh, chenilles are typically cotton uh, uh, of fiber, but we have many chenille yarns that are made from synthetic fibers as well now today. So um, not uh, traditionally was always cotton, but um, today we can see it out of many different synthetic and uh, cotton synthetic blends. Chenille fabrics can be knit or woven in many, many different styles. When we talk about chenille fabrics, we're really talking about the chenille yarn. The yarn is what makes it special. The chenille yarns are made so each yarn has a fluffy pile and looks like a pipe cleaner or a fuzzy caterpillar. Chenille indeed means caterpillar in French. Uh, the resulting fabrics are thick, plush, and very absorbent if made in cotton fiber. The synthetic fibers aren't so absorbent. So over here we have a chenille yarn. You can see it's so soft and fuzzy. Uh, and here we have a knitted chenille. Um, and you can sort of see the plush fabric, uh, or the plush yarns give the fabric a nice plush all over texture. Very soft, comfy, warm, uh, inviting fabric, whether knit or woven. Chintz. Uh, chintz refers to any cotton plain weave that is densely woven and has a shiny glazed finish. This finish is chemically applied to the fabric after it's woven and dyed or printed. The shiny glaze helps to make the fabric water and stain resistant. 
It also makes the fabric quite stiff. Uh, chintz can be solid, but is often prin printed. Now, uh, it's often printed and was typically used with, um, for either tablecloths or like upholstery uh, because that chintz finish, again, is so water resistant. Um, uh, you can even use it on outdoor furniture and things like that. Uh, it doesn't need to have a print, but it often has sort of garish, ugly floral prints associated with it, even though it's the finish that really categorizes it. And that's actually, if you've heard of the phrase chintzy, uh, it kind of means kind of tacky or garish. Um, it comes from the nature of these fabrics to typically be uh, kind of have these over the top uh, floral prints or printed patterns. And then of course, in addition with the glaze makes them shiny. So altogether, um, a, a kind of, mm, how to say, over the top uh, fabric in nature. Dotted Swiss. So this is a fabric of Swiss origin and is kind of dainty and lightweight. It's often semi-sheer, but can come in opaque versions as well. Um, it features a dotted, uh, a raised dotted pattern. And the pattern is actually achieved by using a special loom called the Lappet Loom. I have a little image of the Lappet Loom here and you can sort of Google your own research too if you want to know more about how the Lappet Loom works. But essentially what it does is it is capable of um, almost like um, embroidering small patterns on top of the uh, fabric it weaves. And that's how we get these little kind of raised dots. They have a texture to them. Um, and we can sort of see here they have special needles that come and do these sort of repeated patterns um, uh, for a sort of textured, embroidered like it's not exactly embroidery, but it's embroidered like uh, onto the fabric. Next we have eyelet, a very similar fabric to our dotted Swiss. Um, and eyelet fabrics are a cotton plain weave that features small holes in the fabric that are secured and embellished with surrounding embroidery. This type of fabric can be soft or crisp, um, but is usually lightweight and can range from opaque to semi-sheer. Eyelet fabrics can come in a variety of different patterns and can resemble lace, but aren't true laces. These two often are um, uh, uh, created with a lappet uh, loom to create the embroidery style. It really just depends on how complex it is and um, how the mill really wants to achieve uh, the texture and patterning. Pique. Pique is a fabric. This should have a little accent on it. I just couldn't figure out how to put it on there. Uh, Pique is a fabric that features a texture design woven directly into the fabric. This is achieved by using either a jacquard or dobby loom with an extra set of stuffer yarns to help create texture. I'm going to cover dobby and jacquard looms in more detail later on in this series. So I'm going to leave this here. This is a nice little example of PK. Now it doesn't have to be this texture. Typically PK textures are not super complicated. Um, uh, they're kind of geometric in nature. Um, uh, again, not hugely ornate, um, but again, are really defined by a sort of raised texture. So you can kind of see these are almost like little bumps in the fabric. Uh, and that is accented again by the, those stuffer yarns. So we're able to sort of create a little bit thicker quality of the fabric um, that allows us to create a, a, a more defined texture. Plisé. So plisé refers to a technique where fabric is treated with a caustic soda solution. Uh, this causes the fabric to kind of pucker uh, in certain locations. Um, we can apply this in many different ways. Uh, some uh, times the plisé treatment can um, result into what looks like a kind of pleated fabric. Uh, and indeed, plisé means pleat in French. Or we can kind of apply it so it looks kind of like a seersucker in nature. However, the plisé treatment is neither truly a pleat nor truly a seersucker. Satine. Sateen is a cotton that uses the satin weave. Now, we haven't talked about the satin weave before. So um, we'll see this used a lot more in our silk category, but this is sort of 
one of the sole fabric or cotton fabrics that uses the satin weave. Now the satin weave uh, floats either warp or weft yarns over several corresponding yarns before dipping under just one. one. And we can see that illustrated here. So we have the weft yarns are floating over uh, three. And I would, uh, for satins, um, at least three floats has to be done. Sometimes we see them over several uh, yarns. So you could see them over four or five or six. On uh, here, it's just three. But we're floating it over here, and then we dip under just one, and then we float over several more, and then we dip under just one. Um, and what this does is it creates sort of a, a very smooth face uh, that can accents, accent and emphasize uh, the luster of a fabric. Now, a lot of times these sateens are also used with mercerized uh, cotton, which can enhance this luster, um, lustrous finish. Sateen is a very beautiful weave uh, and again can enhance the natural lustrous qualities of a fiber. However, uh, floating these yarns so many at a time over their sort of corresponding yarns makes the fabric prone to snag and very weak. So it's pretty, but it's not very strong. Seersucker. So I mentioned that before in our please section. So what is seersucker? So seersucker is a lightweight cotton, um, uh, lightweight to medium weight, I'd say. Uh, uh, and it's a plain weave uh, where when it is woven, the yarns are woven with varying tensions. This creates a small pucker texture in the fabric. Uh, seersucker often has small stripes, but can be solid or printed as well. It really refers to this uh, method of weaving uh, where the yarns are again are placed under varying tensions to create puckers. The texture of puck, uh, seersucker is similar to plisé. Uh, however, plisé is created with a chemical treatment and can fade over time, where seersucker texture is woven in and will remain. And again, this can be used as a, a shirting uh, fabric, it's used for suits, um, lightweight summer fabric, um, very nice, kind of very fun, kind of whimsical in nature, I'd say. That's it. That's all the cottons you need to know for now. Now, I will say that we did not include any, well, some cotton knits. Um, all of those were cotton wovens, unless sort of um, identified as being woven or knit. Uh, I'm going to do a section of knits all together where I'm going to go over because it just makes sense to me to do a, a section of knits on its own. But uh, tomorrow we're going to start our journey into the world of wool uh, and I'll hope you join me then. So I hope you learned a little bit something about cotton fabrics um, and again we'll uh, pick up tomorrow with the world of wool.